uh, is, is such a dear friend of mine. Uh, when, when we first came to Love City, uh, his dear mom was here, and they were one of the first people to really reach out to us and say, uh, we really want to take you out, and we want to get to know you. And, and uh, right in the beginning, I remember one time, you didn't like me too much. But <laughs> after he figured out who I was, he goes, I think I could stick around for this guy. He's going to be all right. And uh, I'm so thankful, so thankful that God brought you into my life, that God has brought your mom into my life, and that I was able to experience her in, in some of the, the funnest years of my life. And uh, she was always such an encouragement. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Gary, uh, Gary's mom passed away at the beginning of the year. And uh, it's interesting to see what's going on with Gary now. Uh, he's starting to live life like he's never lived before. And uh, experiencing the love of God and the power of God in a new way in his life. Uh, is it okay if I share a little bit about you? Yeah. Okay. He's going to talk in a second, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but Gary uh, has been through his fair share of things. And uh, even when his mom was sick in the hospital, I remember one thing, you might have this written in your notes, and I apologize if I share this, but, uh, and, and you wanted to, but um, I remember when Mary was at River Ridge, she was at the nursing home there, and uh, Gary uh, started to experience some things in his body. He was in the hospital in um, Cooperstown, and I remember you saying to me, he goes, you know, if it's my time to go, I'll go. And then he said, you know, maybe if, if I'm not well enough to be by myself. You said, maybe mom and I can get a room by ourselves at River Ridge. I'm so thankful that that wasn't God's plan. Because Gary's healthier than he's been for, I mean, in a long time. Uh, but just the, the, the power of God that can go into somebody's body. When they just said, you know, I feel like all hope is lost. I don't think I have anything left. That God can say to him, I'm not done with you. I've still got a plan for you. I've still got a purpose for you. And uh, I think one of the things that Gary does a great job at, and I'm going to let him talk in a second, is <laughs> Are you sure? he has an amazing network of faith friends. And so when, when he's going through a rough time, he, he reaches out to people. He doesn't just go seclude himself. He doesn't just hide in a closet. He says, you know, I'm going through something. Can you help me? Can you pray for me? Will, will you stand with me? And I know many of you in this room have stood with him through the thick and thin. So why don't, why don't you go ahead and share some things? Before I even go through there, um, I want to apologize. Right after I get done here, I'm leaving for Manhattan. I'm going to be... Another new chapter in my life, and it's going to be a new chapter for this congregation, too. I can't say what's going on, but in the next few weeks, um, there will be some more going on. And also, before I go say any more, i got to thank you, God, every, each and every one of you, for being me, with me during the time when I was really down mm. and being with me at this point. You know, My life has changed so much. You know? Amen. And I just want to share, if you, if yeah. you don't mind, through uh, much of adversity and with the help of God, this is what I found. For all my struggles and disappointments, the, the answers to life's most difficult situations are usually s simple. It is God is in it. Amen. He's always in the situation, yeah. even when you're struggling, yeah. you know, yeah. and then when you're on a mountaintop. Mm -hmm. So I want to take you through a little journey through the life of Gary. Yeah. Back in 2014, um, they thought they found a tumor in this body, and we prayed about it, and we, and we worked that through that situation. And then and I believe in 2015, I started having little problems with my heart, and and I I didn't really didn't take care of myself. I I was more dedicated to um, the second love of my life, and that was my mom. And through that, um, the blood pressure, and then they found that I had congested heart failure, and that was, that was something I I took medication for, and then. This past February, 
I retired in, in April. They found that I had, pro I had prostate cancer. And during this, that time, too, mom fell and she broke her hip and she was in a nursing home. And you all know the story, what happened there. But through that, um, yeah, I struggled and, and a lot of used it, too. Um, but through that, um, I was taking medication for the heart and, and it started uh, doing the, the I, they couldn't operate because of, of the heart. Um, but through that, uh, I was taking radiation, and I took 44 treatments of radiation. Uh, when I got my new car in September, I turned the air, the heat on just to see what it was like, and I, I turned out right off. It felt too much like, you know, the radiation burning. Uh, but through that, um, um, I, I was staying with a, a, my second family, um, uh, Johnny and Elaine, and this is beloved mom and parents, you know. And they made me felt comfortable. I was secure, you know. And I, t and I, I was thankful for that. But I grew also during that time period. Mm. Um, at that time, I was driving back from a Sunday evening service. Um, and I, could, I was having a hard time breathing. And then, I was afraid of stopping on the road because you just don't know who would come along, you know. And no, now I would stop or anything, but before it was a lot of fear. But I had problems breathing, and they took me um, by ambulance to Saratoga. And from Saratoga, four days later, they took me into Albany. Mm -hmm. And they were thinking about putting a defibrillator and a pacemaker in this heart, in this body, to, to control the heart. And, but before that, um, they did the test from through the, my veins, through my arm, and down through my throat. Uh, and I think that day, uh, Pastor Josh and Larissa with me, were with me when they came back and gave us the, new, the good news. Yeah. And right at that time, um, I had roommates that I was sharing about because he was an alcoholic and recovering, and I was sharing about God with him. But we broke out in the Holy Spirit, and we, I think we, we, we were laughing for at least 10 to 15 minutes yeah. because the yeah. Holy Spirit just fell on us. After they left, he asked why we were laughing, and I told him point blank that you know, we were drunk in the Holy Spirit, and, <laughs> and it was something that he needed to know because it's better than that wine or whatever he was taking, the yeah. drugs, whatever. On, you know, our God is much stronger. Yeah, you know? that's right. I don't really need these notes. <laughs> <laughs> you you lived it. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm living and I'm living for God. You know? And and then the next few weeks I'm gonna be having all the, the remaining teeth taken out, you know. Uh, I'm on medication for the heart and for the and I'm in bed remission for what the last um, since May. Mm -hmm. Uh, in remission from the cancer. Yeah. Folks, sometimes you're in remission, but you also have it. So you, if, when you think that you're done with that, just keep fighting that battle That's because right. God, you know, if you don't, you're never going to be through, you know, and you're not going to be able. Uh, you know, and I'm, like I said, I'm going to be having my teeth taken out. I'm le like I said, I'm leaving for uh, Manhattan, but I want you to share what else is coming up in the next few well, months. Well, Gary has applied to uh, go to the Justice School uh, with Jeremy Krause in Thailand in 2019. And, uh, and so uh, I sat down with him the other day and we filled out the entire application and uh, he's on the list to go over to Thailand. So how cool is that? And... Um, you know, one thing that Gary has always done, and he, he just said it really, really well, that um, even when you think that you've gone through the battle and you're done with the battle, don't stop fighting. Uh, because it just, it gives the devil a, a door to just come in and just kind of have his way. And uh, one thing Dodie Osteen, uh, Joel Osteen's mom, uh, she had cancer in the 80s. 
And uh, she just started declaring what the Word of God says about her body. And it's still, even to this day, she's been cancer-free for over 40 years now. But even to this day, she wakes up in the morning and she talks to her body and she tells her body what the Word of God says, not what a doctor says. Right. And so that cancer has never come back on her. And uh, one, th you know, one of the trips that I went with, uh, with Gary, I don't know if you have anything else to share or not, but... Uh, uh, for a while, you know, in, in, uh, during all this, I hope this doesn't embarrass you, but I think it's a real, uh, a real big point in this whole thing. You know, when, when he had prostate cancer, obviously there was some issues with the way that uh, his body was supposed to work. And so he had to have a catheter for quite a while. And a lot of you didn't know that. And uh, he was always wearing long pants and things like that and was covered up. And uh, <laughs> thank God, right? Uh, <laughs> And so uh, we went to Cooperstown. He said, Pastor, I really want you to go to this appointment with me. I said, okay. And, and uh, I said, well, here's what we're going to believe God for. We're going to believe God that that catheter is going to come out, and you're going to be able to use the restroom the way a normal person would use the restroom. Amen. And so they came in. And they said, now, now Gary, we're going to do a test. Now, for those of you who have never had this test, it's not very fun. But... Uh, Right. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God for curtains in the room. I wasn't sitting there through the whole thing. But the doctor said, you can stand behind the curtain. I said, I think I will. Thank you very much. Uh, and so, you know, it was very painful, but they filled his bladder and they said, uh, now, Gary, if you can release this, then you can go home without a catheter. And so they filled him and the doctor left the room. And I said, Gary, we're going to believe that that empties out completely and you're going to walk out of here and you're going to be able to wear shorts when you leave here, right? Because that was one of the big things. Yeah. He goes, finally, I can wear shorts again, right? And so uh, they came back in. And I know I've had this test done. It's not fun. But uh, they, they came back in and he was able to empty completely. And they sent him home, right? So we rode home. We're just rejoicing in, in what God has just done, you know, because he, he just felt like, well, maybe I'm going to have to have a bag the rest of my life. And uh, he was just rejoicing. And, and, and uh, he said, now nah, i got to go back two weeks later. And so he went, it was two weeks later, you went back, and they did an ultrasound to make sure there was nothing in the bladder and you were completely empty. And so uh, in, a, in a place where the doctors were ready to start trying some exploratory surgery, uh, God just said, well, wait a minute. I'm going to do something in this body. Yeah. And uh, so Gary has been bag free for months now. Yeah. And, uh, and I've lost 62 pounds. And he's lost, <laughs> 62, pounds. He's lost 62 pounds. And so uh, he's getting ready for a wife, I think. Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, thank you, Gary. God bless you, man. Hallelujah. Give it up for Gary. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I'm just going to preach real quick. Is that all right? Yeah. If I preach fast, you can listen fast and we'll get out of here fast. How about that? <laughs> Open up your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 23. That's where we're going to begin this morning. Let's just pray and ask God to come into this place. He's already here, but let us, let, let's just welcome him while we uh, receive his word. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. You said where two or three are gathered together that you're right here in the midst of us. And I thank you, Lord, that as your word goes forth this morning, that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive what your word has said to us today. I thank you, Lord, that the word would be planted deep within our heart, that it would produce a great harvest of fruit, God. We thank you, Lord, that we're not going to leave here the same way that we came in here, but we're going to leave here radically and drastically changed by your presence and by your power. Father, we ask right right now for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened so we would know what is the hope of your calling we thank you for it and we praise you for it in Jesus name amen hallelujah this is the conclusion of uh, tongue-tied and uh, this has just been a really fun series for me I've really enjoyed this hearing people's stories about what God has brought them through and then also talking about our confession of faith and what we're believing God for uh, but here today we're going to talk about choosing joy how I many you know it's a choice whether you're in joy or whether you're not you might say, well, my circumstances don't really allow me to be in joy. Well, you can control that circumstance. 
Come on, you can start to uh, experience joy in the middle of your circumstance. Last week, Brother Gary Barkovic preached in Amsterdam, and he said something uh, about, you know, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. That's what Jesus said, right? But in the very next breath, Jesus said, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. So even in the midst of the tribulation, even in the midst of the battle, Jesus himself is saying to the church, be of good cheer. Amen. And so here you are, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 23. It says, a man or woman has joy by the answer of his mouth. And a word spoken in due season, how good it is. So this kind of puts the pressure off of everybody else. And it puts the pressure back on you. What are you saying with your mouth? Because what you're saying with your mouth is either going to lead you to joy or it's going to lead you to distress and discouragement, right? right? Remember in the first message, I don't know if all y'all can remember that far back. It's been a while. But we talked about how your tongue can either bring blessing or it can bring cursing. It can either bring words of life or it can speak words of death. And, and James said, this ought not be that you would have both of those things coming out of the same mouth. So how many of you know if you're speaking blessing, if you're speaking life, then you're going to have joy by the answer of your mouth. Amen. 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 In Psalms chapter 118 and verse 24 says, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, somebody. That's what we do. That's who we are. And you might say, well, it's Sunday, so I guess we can rejoice today because it's the Lord's day. Come on, any day that ends with the word day is a good day to rejoice. You might have to think about that for a second. Let's see, there's something more. I, I can rejoice every day. Well, bless the Lord. Yeah, you can rejoice every day. Hallelujah. I love the way the Good News Translation says. It says, this is the day of God's victory. Let us be happy and let us celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, it's a celebration every day. Come on, whatever has breath is, is to praise the Lord. If you've got breath in your lungs, you can praise the Lord. Amen. And so we're talking about every day. What does this rejoicing look like? Well, that word rejoice there in Psalm 18, uh, 118 and verse 24, it means to rejoice and to be glad. It means to rejoice arrogantly. Come on, nobody likes somebody who's arrogant all the time. But when you know what your God has done for you, you just start rejoicing arrogantly. You're just like, man, he's blessed me so good. I'm going to rejoice no matter who's looking. The other day, Ruthie uh, went to Sackendaga Bible Camp this week, and it was just such a wonderful relief for us just to have a house quiet. Praise the Lord. But, uh, you know... Uh no, I'm just kidding. She just had a wonderful time out in camp. And one of the mornings that I dropped her off, I said, you know what? I'm already halfway almost around the lake. So I'm going to go ahead and drive the rest of the way and go over the Edinburgh Bridge, whatever that's called, and go over the other bridge and go through Northfield and then come back home. And I put on this album uh, by Eddie James, and it's just uh, it's called God, Me, and My Piano. And one of the things that always sticks out to me when he's singing, I mean, he's just a powerful worship leader, but I was just worshiping God and, and, and driving around and looking at God's creation and all these things. And one of the things he says, he goes, I don't care who's looking, I know who's worthy. And every time he says that, I just do a happy dance right in my car. I do a happy dance in my office. I don't care who's looking. I know who's worthy. Come on, you have to realize that our priority is God first. It's not who's looking. It's not your best friend. It's not your family. It's God first. And so if you feel like dancing in God's presence, you ought to dance in God's presence. If you feel like shouting in God's presence, you ought to shout in God's presence. If you feel like jumping in God's presence, you ought to jump in God's presence. Come on, God's presence is nothing to just be played with. It is something that we burst forth into, we run into, we choose to be in. And I say, well, I don't, I don't go to a church like that. Well, you're in a church like that right now. Come on, somebody. Come on, it's your choice. It's your choice to get in there. Rejoice arrogantly. Say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Come on, he healed my body. Come on. We used to sing a song back years ago, and they still sing it in some camp meeting uh, services. And they say, look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord has done. 
Come on, if you don't, I don't care what your neighbor's doing. Come on, this is not about you worshiping your neighbor. This is about you worshiping God. I've told this story before, but when I was growing up, I remember this girl who was interested in me. And uh, that was a, a surprise anyways that anybody was interested. But bless, bless the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. It was just a joke. Uh, but I was standing on like this side of the church, kind of like where Brother Carl is. And she was over on the exact opposite side. And I remember, you know, I've been a worshiper for a long time, but uh, I, I remember just standing there and I, 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 I knew she, looked, she liked me and I knew she was looking at me. So I just worship real good. <laughs> Surely if she's in church, she wants a man of God, you know. And I looked up every time, you know, I put my hands up, I looked over and she's like, she put her hands up too. <laughs> Come on, don't be a copycat. Do what God's telling you to do. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. What, you know, and you might say, well, this is in the Old Testament, so, you know, they used to dance differently than we dance today. Sure, they're probably not flossing, you know, in the Old Testament, you know, whatever. You know, if Ruth was here, she'd do that thing like this. You know, How they do that thing, right? But the New Testament also talks about rejoicing. Remember the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, while he was in maritime prison, in one of the nastiest prisons of that century, he, he, he wrote this letter to the church that says, Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. So here we have a Hebrew word that was in Psalms that, that was samak. So sometimes you just need to samak somebody and get them into the presence of God, right? But here in the New Testament is the word Cairo. This word Cairo means to be glad. It means to rejoice. It means to rejoice exceedingly. Come on, do you, you all remember Back to the Future? And Marty is sitting there playing his guitar and he goes over to the amp and he turns it up to 11. Or am I just thinking of this in my own mind? Maybe I'm not. Maybe, maybe I don't know if this is really in the movie, but I just imagine it this way. And he turns it up to 11. And he hits that thing, and it just shakes everything in the house. Yeah. Come on, just when you think 10 was as high as it can go, he cranked it up to 11. Yeah. Come on, so just when you think your praise is good enough, crank it up to 11. Yeah. Crank it up to 11 and see what God can do. Brother Mark Hankins, Pastor Mark says this. He says, your celebration is a demonstration of your revelation. So if you don't have anything revealed to you about who you are in Christ, your celebration is going to be very limited. He also says your celebration is a demonstration of your expectation. You know, he says this. He said, you know, sometimes people just have faith for something. They have faith for something. They have faith for something. But they've never mixed a little bit of joy there in the middle. If they just mix a little bit of joy with their faith, God would put them over to the other side. Hallelujah. And so it's just a little bit of mixture. Come on. I don't know about you, but I've been on this new fresh diet, right? And I don't know if it's showing yet or not, but I'm blessing God. It's going to start working soon. I'm wearing my nice shoes today, and I'm gonna, it's going to be a good day. But uh, I started following this recipe because I said, if I'm going to do this diet, i got to have one way out that I can eat sweets and still be happy with myself. <laughs> Y'all ever been on a diet and you're just miserable? Like as soon as you get on a diet, it's just miserable. Maybe I'm just the only one. Everybody just likes eating rabbit food and they're just smiling like crazy. <laughs> I said, I got to figure out how to eat cheesecake and be happy about it. And so I found this recipe, right? I found a recipe. That's a keto cheesecake. So I said, well, bless God. I tried one and it was disgusting. But then I found another recipe. I said, I'm going to follow this thing right to the T. And I should have added more lemon zest. But other than that, it was like I was eating, eating real cheesecake. I'm like, I could rejoice in this cheesecake. I'm rejoicing so much, I think I'll have another piece. Come on. This is really good. God's doing something awesome. I'm so glad that he made up this diet so I can eat cheesecake all day long. Come on, no matter what you're going through, you can rejoice in the middle. You know, y'all laughing pretty good today, but you know, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22 says, a merry heart does good like a medicine. Come on, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drives the bones. You might say, well, people are gonna think I'm crazy if I'm just going around laughing all the time. Well, you just tell them you're on medication. Come on, a merry heart does good like medicine. But a broken spirit tries the bones. You know, there's been studies that people, uh, uh, that doctors have tried to get people in, in a good place before they go into surgery. 
laughing about it, excited about it, looking on the other side of it, not going in thinking that they're going to die, but going in thinking that it's going to be so much better when I come out and I'm going to laugh my whole way through it. And he's, they said, you know, if, if you go in thinking you're going to die, your chances of dying are greater. But if you go in thinking good and, 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 and having a merry heart about what God can do in your life, your chances are greater. Yeah. There's even therapy classes that just sit there and make you laugh. Yeah. Come on, some of us, we, we walk around depressed. All you need to do is get a good belly laugh every once in a while. Come on, I'm living proof of that. Uh, not too long ago, I had issues with that. I had struggles with depression. But now I just start to laugh. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I saw not too long ago we were watching America's Got Talent and this one person got up there and said I'm a laughter therapist and she got up there and she just started laughing <laughs> and the whole audience started laughing with her well, Mary Hart does good like medicine a broken spirit dries the bones. T.D. Jake says this. You know Bishop T.D. Jake. He said, if you don't rejoice, the devil thinks that he's winning. So you need to make a choice to rejoice. Come on, you tie your tongue to what God is going to do. You tie your tongue, you just get happy about it. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, my brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials, the Amplified Bible says, consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever you are enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations. Amen. Come on, you can just do it like a math problem. You say, you know what? My car stinks, period. Uh, my wife doesn't look at me the same anymore, period. Uh, my kids are living for the devil, Period. You can look at that and you just put a plus sign next to it and you say, okay, okay, okay. And you know what all those things equal? Joy. <laughs> the devil would have you think that, that 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 math problem would equal you being depressed. It would equal you uh, thinking about suicidal thoughts. It would equal you about ending your life or running away so you could start something new. But God would say all of these things equal joy. Consider it joy, my brethren, when you go through anything. Consider it joy when everything is trying to come in on you. When there's trials, when there's temptations, consider it pure joy. Come on, it's making a choice. Come on, some people can look at us and say, well, you've just had it good all your life. Well, you don't know about my life. You just see the fruit of what God has done in us up until this point. But you haven't seen what we've walked through in the 10 plus years that I've been with my wife. But God. Come on, but God. Come on, when you're a person of faith, you believe God. Yes. You know, in Abraham, he said that he was, it was accounted unto him for righteousness because he believed God. Yes. He didn't look at God and say, God, you're nuts, so there's no way I'm going to be able to have a kid. There's no way Sarah's going to be able to have a kid. He said, God, if that's what you're saying, I'm going to agree with what you're saying. And now you might say, well, I don't have God coming up in my bedroom. I don't have him standing at the foot of my bed like Brother Hagin. You don't need him to stand at the foot of your bed like Brother Hagin. You have his word right in your hand that you can start confessing for yourself and say, I choose joy. I choose joy. I choose joy. No matter what What's coming against me? I'm going to choose joy. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, joy is the serious business of heaven. So when you're laughing at the devil, come on, when you're praising God like nobody's watching, and you're in the church house and you're doing this, God's at your house doing some business at your house. Come on, he's getting some things in order for you at your house. Come on, there's a transaction that happens when joy takes place. Joy is the serious business of heaven. He said, look at these people praising me. Look at them worshiping me. I think I'm gonna come right down in their presence and have a good old time with them. No, you might wonder why God never shows up for you because you're never welcoming him. You need to welcome him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the Apostle Paul said some amazing things. When they were on a, a, uh, a journey, uh, an angel appeared to him, and he told his people, I urge you, this is in Acts chapter 27, verse 22, he says, I urge you to take heart. 
He says, there's not going to be any loss of life among you, but only the ship. How I many you know that was good news? Because they were all concerned that they were going to die. He said, surely there's going to be a huge wave that takes us out. Something is going to take us out. I, I, most of them didn't even want to go. Paul in, it actually gave them a warning. He said, don't go. But now in the middle of everybody going and Paul being on the boat, an angel of the Lord appears to him. In verse 23, it says, There stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid. Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. Indeed, God granted you all those who sail with you. And then he says to them, Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe that God, I believe God that it will be just as the way it was told me. How I many you know they ended up at their destination? There was a shipwreck, but there was no loss of life. And so when you hold on to what God is saying about you, it's going to happen exactly the way that God said it's going to happen. Amen. Paul really is just saying everybody just needs to cheer up here. <laughs> I see the wind. I see the wave. I see that it's contrary to us. I see what's going on, but I believe God and God is on our side. You know, even, uh, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, the, people just abandon us. You ever feel like that? Yeah. Like maybe some people in your life you've been real close friends with, and all of a sudden it's just like, poof. Yeah. Yeah. You never see them again. Yeah. And you can go on for days and days and days and weeks and years and decades if you want to about saying, well, man, I really wish I could have done something different. I really wish I could have just kept them right here. I really love those people. And you need to realize, you know, even if everybody deserts you, the Lord is going to stand with you. And Jesus himself, you know, he, he, he started talking about his crucifixion and his resurrection. And the disciples said, you know, this is a real hard thing for us to swallow. It's not easy for us to receive what you're telling us right now. He said, many of the multitudes left him and followed him no longer. But then he, uh, Jesus looks at his closest 12, those 12 that were sitting there with him. And he says, now what are you going to do? You're going to go and leave too? And Peter speaks up. He goes, God, or Jesus, if, if we were to go, where would we go? This, this is us now. This is our life. This is everything that we know. We're not going to leave you. The apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm almost done. And verse 16, he says, at my defense, no one stood with me. How many of y'all ever been there? Yeah. Come on, at my defense, nobody stood with me. They just all forsook me. Yeah. The Apostle Paul says, don't, don't charge that against them. He said, but verse 17, he says, the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me so that this message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion." <laughs> he goes while I'm glorifying God he also delivered me from a lion just so you know <laughs> he doesn't stop there he says the same God that delivered me he's going to deliver you he says he's going to deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom to him be the glory forever and ever Come on, at first it looks like real grim. Man, nobody stood with me. Nobody stayed with me. They all forsook me. They were embarrassed of my chains. They were ashamed of my chains. But the Lord, he stood with me. And he even delivered me from the lion. Praise the Lord. Come on, we're, we, we have the same Jesus living on us. We have the same Holy Spirit living in us that the Apostle Paul had. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, you, he made alive. Yeah. Come on, you can just look at you. You take this finger, point it at somebody else, now point it back at yourself. He made me alive. Right. When I was dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom uh, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of our mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Aren't you glad that God didn't leave us right there? Yeah. Come on, verse four, he says, but God... But God, who is so rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he's made us alive together with Christ. 
for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, right? And he's raised us up together and he's made us sit together uh, with Christ in heavenly places. This is where arrogance comes in. This is where rejoicing arrogantly comes in because you know where you're seated. Come on, when your whole family says you don't belong there, you don't deserve that, you can say I am royalty. I've got the same God. God gave me the same inheritance he gave to Jesus and I'm just receiving that inheritance now. (laughs) Hallelujah. We've been seated together with him. Hallelujah. Come on, we're the triumphant church. We're a mighty moving force. There's not anybody that can stop the church. No government can stop the church. Come on, no demon can stop the church. We are the church. It's not a building. We are. We are the body of Christ. The same victory that Jesus experienced when he walked out of the grave is the same victory that we have right now. We can rejoice in that very same victory. The very life of God has been breathed into you. The same life is in every believer, hallelujah, even if you're the little pinky toe of the body of Christ. Do you realize that the pinky toe has the same blood flowing through it that the heart has? The pinky toe has the same blood flowing through it that the head has. So if the head has been uh, uh, washed in the blood, so has that pinky toe been washed in the blood. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So no matter what you're going through, you've got to say, well, listen, I'm on the triumph train. I'm on the victory train. I don't know what I'm going to go through on my way to my final destination, but I know that the final destination is victory. Come on, I know that the final destination is triumph. I know that the final destination is being raised up with Christ, seated right next to him in heavenly places. <laughs> Come on, Jesus didn't go what he went through just to help you just a little bit. Come on, he he changed everything. He changed your identity. He changed your family history. He changed your wants and your desires. He changed your needs. Come on, he changed everything. He changed your gifting. He changed your calling. A lot of you, he changed your name. You used to be called by something else, but God has called you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He's not called you a defeated foe. He's called you the head and not the tail. He's called you above only and not beneath. He's called you more than a conqueror. He's called and said that everything that you put your hands to will prosper. Come on. He said that every tongue that rises up against you is going to be proved to be in the wrong. I just get excited about what the word of God says about me. I don't know how people can just sit there and just say, oh. That was nice. Come on, God didn't do this for you so that you could say that was nice. (laughs) Come on. We need to get ready to say something. You say, Pastor, but you got all those things memorized. That's why you say it. Well, you're a person just like I am. You can memorize the same verses. Come on, you can memorize the same things that God has said about you. You know, we know according to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, there's two main ingredients to speaking in faith. Yeah. Number one, we need to believe it, right? Number two, and the, the first initial act of being in faith is to say something with our mouth. Yeah. Come on, we need to choose to say something. We need to choose to be in joy. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I've said this before, and I'm almost closed here. I'm on my last page of notes. Bless the Lord. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said, no man can doubt when he learns how to shout. (laughs) No man can doubt when he learns how to shout. You remember when David was bringing back the Ark of the Covenant? 
He said, every six paces, he goes, hold up, boys. We're going to give a sacrifice to God. And he started dancing before the Lord. He started dancing arrogantly before the Lord. Well, I dance in my heart. My inner person is dancing. Well, your outer person looks like the wicked witch of the West. You better hurry up and change something about that. Come on, joy. You know, I always said the dumbest song that we ever sing to children, I got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. Yeah, you should be filled with the joy of the Lord, but when you're so filled with the joy of the Lord, it should come back up and you should spew it out on some other people. Come on, don't just let it stay there and say, well, I'm filled with the joy of the Lord. I'm really filled. Look at me. I'm really filled. This is as good as it gets. You know, Come on, there's a yielding that needs to happen. There's a yielding to the spirit that needs to happen. You might say, I don't want to look like all those crazy people. I don't want to run around the church. I don't want to jump around the church. I don't want to dance around the church. What if I shout and I scare off a wig in front of my, you know, the person that's sitting in front of me and the wig just falls off? Who cares? They'll probably get up and start dancing too. <laughs> you know, there's one time my parents are here this morning. We went to, I go in out in Broad Alban. And uh, I just like to be very obvious and uh, sometimes very loud. And I was sitting there, and uh, this one gentleman walks in, and I, and I knew it was a wig on his head. I just knew. You know, I just said, I go, Dad. Dad. That guy's got a wig on his head. And then the people on the other table heard me, so then they looked. Now, either this guy was Mo from the Three Stooges or he had a real wig, just like Mo. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, I mean, it was just crazy. But, you know, uh, bless the Lord, when the spirit gets moving, I think wigs start falling off. Come on. Come on, if we're in a... <laughs> Y'all ever see how, uh, you know, the... You know, the uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this most politically correct. But, you know, some churches... Uh, you know, they play one note on the organ. All of a sudden, the ladies are up and running around. I mean, I mean, wigs falling off, weaves falling off, you know, those kind. You know what I'm talking about? You know, I mean, I, they just know how to party. It's like one note gets hit, and they're like, we're in the presence of God. Glory! <laughs> they don't care who's sitting next to them. Come on, you ought not to care who's sitting next to you. And say, bro, haven't you looked at me lately? I'm white. I have no rhythm. Who cares? <laughs> no, we got plenty of people with no rhythm. Let them just dance before the Lord. <laughs> no, it didn't say that you had to be full of rhythm. You just dance arrogantly before the Lord. You choose joy. Here's what happens when you choose joy. When you choose joy, the glory of God will fill you as you begin to sing and as you begin to shout and as you begin to dance and rejoice before the Lord. When you rejoice, the glory of God will be made manifest. Come on, when you rejoice, the enemy will be silenced. When you rejoice, you will be strengthened with the joy of the Lord. When you rejoice, you'll be able to dream again. Some of y'all have just cut off the whole dreaming mechanism in your head. It's time to start dreaming again. It's time to start believing God again. That what God has promised, he's surely going to be able to do. And exceedingly, abundantly above all that you could ask or think or even imagine. It's time to start dreaming again. And when you rejoice, your mouth will be filled with laughter. Your mouth will be filled with singing. When you rejoice, there's no storm, there's no adversity that would ever be able to keep you down. When you rejoice, you're a happier person. Yes. And when you rejoice, God is magnified. Yes. Stand up with me, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this word, Lord God. Today, we choose joy. No matter what the circumstances say, no matter what our family might say, no matter what our bank account might say, no matter what our, our doctor's report might say, we choose joy today. Yes. Father, I thank you for this word. 
Now, this is an on-time word. In, in tying our tongue, what we're going to tie our tongue to, we're not going to tie it to uh, uh, the situation. We're not going to tie it to, to the struggle that we're going through. We're going to tie it to what your word says. We're going to tie it to being in joy. We're going to rejoice always, and again, we're going to rejoice, and we're going to rejoice again, and we're going to rejoice again, and we're going to rejoice again. We're going to shout again. We're going to dance again. We're going to run again. We're going to lift you up again. We're going to worship you again. Again. We're going to praise you again. We're going to read the word again. We're going to meditate again. We're going to get in your presence again. Come on, we're going to run into your presence. Yes. Father, we thank you that you've enabled us by the blood of your son Jesus to run into the presence of God. That same very blood is the blood which Jesus entered back into the Holy of Holies and he's made the way for us to enter into. Father, we thank you for it. And now right now, for just a few moments, every head bowed, every eye closed, we never want to leave an atmosphere like this without giving you an invitation to make Jesus your Lord. You know, this is more important than anything that we've done today. This is the most important part of the service. If you're here today and you, you, you just can't say, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I've got Jesus as my Lord. I haven't been living for him. I've never confessed him as my Lord. I've never seen his goodness in my life. If that's you and you say, I've got an empty void. I've got an empty void here this morning and I just need to be filled with him. Yes. Just lift your hand up to heaven. Hallelujah. Go ahead, just boldly. If that's you, just say, you know what? Today's my day to start a new relationship with God. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what, I, I, I've had God as, in my life before, but I've, I've, I've run away from him. I've not been living for him. And today I want, I want to come back home. Today is my day. I, I'm going to run to him with open arms, and he's running to you with open arms. If you're here and you just want to recommit your life to him, just slip your hand up. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I see your hand right there in the back. I see you. Anybody else right now? I see your hand in the back there. Come on, it's just a day of reconciliation. It's a day to realize that God is a good God. That he's a faithful God. That he loves you beyond any shadow of a doubt. And he'll never change the way he thinks about you. I think it'd be good if we all just said a prayer of recommitment here this morning. Say, Father God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for welcoming, welcoming me back into your family. Thank you for receiving me. I love you and I'll live for you all the days of my life. Jesus, you are my Lord. You're my savior. You're my friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I thank you for loving me. I love you. And I'll do whatever you tell me to do. In Jesus' name, amen.